Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Chime member Caitlin Shin to the show. And she's going to teach us about fast radio bursts coming from space. But first, we look at a new study showing that stars eating planets may be more common than we thought. A new type of supernova is seen by astronomers as a black hole or neutron star collides with its partner star, and China takes the first steps towards building a space station a kilometer long. About one-third of stars may eat their own planets, a new study out of Italy finds. Researchers examine more than a hundred sun-like stars bound in binary pairs. The team found high levels of iron and lithium on the surface of 33 of these stars, suggesting they had consumed rocky planets similar to Earth and Venus. By knowing which stars devoured their rocky planets, uh, astronomers will have a better idea of where to look for small, rocky worlds like our own. Astronomers have suspected that in certain pairs of binary star systems, one of the stars could form a black hole or a neutron star before colliding with its partner. Predictions suggest such mergers could erupt as a violent form of supernova known as a core collapse supernova. One of these events may have now been witnessed, happening 480 million light years from Earth. On 21st of September, on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're going to talk with Dylan Dong, graduate student at Caltech, who led this discovery. Here's a sneak preview of that interview. I found one in particular that was associated with this dwarf galaxy, this tiny little galaxy uh, that's actually uh, an analog of the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of the satellite galaxies of our Milky Way, except this one is located at 500 million light years away. Uh, and it was not only, uh, you know, a rare event that was associated with a galaxy like this, it was also extremely luminous or something like that. It was, uh, we immediately thought it must be like a supernova or a gamma ray burst, and if it was a supernova, it would actually be tied for the most radioluminous supernova ever observed. And so we, we knew that, you know, there was something here that we needed to dig further into, and so that's what got us started. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. The National Space Foundation in China just funded a study into the feasibility of constructing a new space station. One kilometer or six tenths of a mile long. Such a behemoth space station might be built from next-generation materials currently being developed. Another intriguing possibility is the spacecraft might be 3D printed in space. Such techniques could allow the construction of such a revolutionary vehicle at a minimal cost making the project more likely to happen in the near future. Next up, we learn about fast radio bursts with Chime member Caitlin Shin.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Caitlin Shin. She is a physics graduate student at MIT, and she's here to talk to us about fast radio bursts and the Chime Telescope. Welcome to the show, Caitlin. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. Uh, so just give us a brief introduction. What are fast radio bursts and what makes them so interesting? So fast radio bursts are basically this really brief and really energetic and really mysterious astrophysical phenomenon that we've seen relatively recently um, occur across the sky. And these bursts kind of go off pretty randomly across the sky, so we haven't really been able to detect a lot of these bursts until very recently because the way that a lot of radio telescopes work is you are really sensitive to only a small portion of the sky, so if you're only staring at a small portion of the sky every night, you probably can't catch one of these mysterious bursts. You have to be really lucky in order to get them. And um, these bursts, they're super short. They only last like a few milliseconds. Um, but they're, we know that they are like super energetic and we also know that they must come from mostly outside of our galaxy. And that's pretty much most of the information we have on these fast radio bursts. We don't yet know exactly what astrophysics causes this phenomenon to happen, but it has to be something interesting for it to be so extreme, um, for us to detect it from all the way from another galaxy. And so what makes Chime so ideally suited for studying these FRBs? So Chime has a really unique telescope design. Rather than being a radio dish that stares at just a small portion of the sky, it's kind of shaped like four parabolic cylinders, kind of like snowboarding half pipes, you might say. Um, and it's and it has – exactly. <laughs> and it has <laughs> – it has no moving parts. Um, all uh, the the telescope sky looking is done completely digitally, and so the um, this massive parabolic cylindrical shaped telescope kind of just sits on the ground as the night sky passes over it, and so it's what we call a transit telescope because it watches the entire telescope or the entire night sky that it can see every single night, which means. Rather than being extraordinarily lucky if a burst goes off at just some small portion of the sky that we're looking at, since we see the entire sky, or we pass through the entire sky, we just have a much larger field of view um, and a much better chance of seeing these fast radio bursts if they really did happen all across the sky at a fairly often rate, which is, you know, it wasn't known for sure before the Chime telescope went online, but then it went online. Um, and we, before the Chime telescope went online, I'm pretty sure there were less than a hundred bursts or events, um, probably bursts discovered. And then after Chime went online, within its first year of operation, it's discovered hundreds of these fast radio bursts. And it's done so much cool science within its first year of operations as well. Pretty amazing. So you mentioned that no one knows what's causing these fast radio bursts, but Certainly, there must be some ideas of what could be causing them. Can you just tell us some some of the ideas that are out there? Yeah. So a particularly interesting um, event happened last year, actually just a couple of months into the COVID shutdown. Um, and uh, there was this event that was detected in our galaxy by a different telescope in the X-ray band. And um, the astronomical community was kind of like, oh, we've discovered these, like, X-ray bursts from this known source that's basically a super highly magnetized neutron star called a magnetar. Um, and a neutron star is also a very dense stellar remnant. And so um, they said the, the X-ray community was like, we see these bursts from this magnetar, everyone else take a look at it, see if you see something interesting. And so um, the Chime people, we looked through our data to see if there was anything from that location at that time, and we did see a fast radio burst-like burst that matched all this criteria. And this is 
the first high energy counterpart to a fast radio burst that was seen at coincident times. And so we were like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is cool because right, right. this is kind of like the first observational, confirmed observational coincident detection of a fast radio burst with a known object that happens to be a magnetar, which to be honest, even before this was another was a favorite theory among many fast radio burst scientists for um, other astrophysical reasons. And so um, there's definitely strong evidence for at least some fast radio bursts coming from from these magnetar objects. That's fabulous. So how how do we have any idea of how far away they are? No, I mean, is where is the closest one to Earth? Ooh. So the closest one would be to date would be probably the one that I would just talked about the magnetar because that is in our galaxy. Um, so that's why I'm always careful to say we know most fast radio bursts come from outside our galaxy. I can't quite say all because we have discovered at least one that's definitely within. So that 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 magnetar event SGR 1935 probably the closest to Earth. Um, but we, the, the other reason why we have a sense of how distant these bursts are is because of a property of theirs called the dispersion measure, um, which basically kind of as light travels through an ionized medium like a plasma, it gets dispersed. And so the lower frequency parts of the burst travel slower than the higher frequency parts of the burst. And when you kind of correct for that time delay, you can get an estimate of how much plasma dispersed traveled through, and using pulsars, which we know are from within our galaxy, we have a pretty good estimate of how much plasma a burst might travel through in our galaxy. So if we observe um, a radio burst event that has, um, that that where the, the burst information tells us, oh, it traveled through like a huge amount of like plasma and we know that in that direction our galaxy can only contribute this amount of plasma and there's all this other amount of plasma that's unaccounted for and that must just be from outside of our galaxy. Um, and so that's kind of why we know these events must be extragalactic for the most part. That's fabulous. And so using using those effects, you know, of looking at these radio waves traveling through plasma is actually going to allow you to create a 3D map of interstellar gas, isn't it? Yeah, that, that would be the ultimate goal, I think. Of there, so I, 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 I like to think there are two types of scientists who are interested in fast radio bursts. The first are the scientists who are really interested in what causes these bursts. They're like, are these magnetars or are these different types of events? And then the, sec and there, the second kind of scientist might be, you know, I don't really care what these fast radio bursts are, but I care that we discover a lot of them because if we discover a lot of them with like a really good precision and we have a really good handle on their properties, we can then really probe cosmological questions, make maps of the universe. Um, and there, of course, is overlap between like these, these interested science scientists, but these are, I say, like, yeah, two very primary interesting things about fast radio bursts. And what got you interested in fast radio bursts? Ooh, what got me interested in fast radio bursts? Well, before I went to graduate school, I wasn't a radio astronomer at all, but when I was choosing a research group here, I was, um, I think, mainly interested in making sure that I would be working with a good, friendly, collaborative research environment. Um, and that pretty much happened to coincide pretty nicely. I was vaguely interested in like high energy astrophysical phenomena. And so those kind of two priorities of mine led me to working with the Time FRB group. What other studies or instruments are out there now or even in the future that might help us study these FRBs? Yeah, so there are plenty of other telescopes that are looking at fast radio bursts that aren't necessarily time FRB. Um, so there is um, ASCAP, which is in Australia, um, that has also discovered a lot of fast radio bursts. And these are um, ASCAP and Chime, they're um, radio telescopes, but there are also uh, other wavelengths. So I mentioned X-rays, but also optical telescopes that 
might try and conduct simultaneous observations with um, any of these radio facilities to try and uh, see if there are other counterparts to these radio bursts. And so even though they're called fast radio bursts, maybe they emit in the optical as because we already know they emit in the X-ray um, for at least one event. And so um, those also can help us. And then as far as next generation um, radio telescopes go, there's Hyrax, H-I-R-A-X. I forgot what it stands for, but I believe it will be built in South Africa. Um, and there's also uh, the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, which um, would also, both of those would see lots of cross radio bursts in the future as well. That's amazing. And so how common are these things? You mentioned that it was rare to see one within our galaxy, you know, which has, of course, you know, 200, 400 billion stars. Um, but if we're only seeing, you know, maybe a handful of them, even at this point when, you know, when observations are just beginning, how often, let's say, would do you expect that one would be going off in our galaxy? It's hard to extrapolate from, uh, so the time FRB put out their first catalog release um, very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, it was made public. And in that, we made an estimate of the all-sky rate that we detect, uh, the all-sky rate of fast radio bursts going off that we detect. And that doesn't distinguish between how nearby is it or how far away is it when we float that. So that number is about 800 per sky per day at a given um, radio telescope sensitivities that we're looking at, so at a given flux level and also at a given um, threshold. But it's hard to extrapolate that to a number that we can see within our galaxy. Again, because the number within our galaxy is so rare, these are majority extragalactic events. Right. And also because if we don't, we also don't have a model for where these bursts might come from. So Say we were like, oh, these bursts come from magnetars, and we can make some sort of estimate for how many magnetars are in our galaxy. I think right now it's only about 25 confirmed ones. But then if we like make some estimate for, um, you know, how often might these like bursts from these objects, I might be able to give you a more concrete answer. But we're not there quite yet. All right. All right. And finally, what what is next for you? What's your what's your next line of study? How are you going yeah, to keep so, exploring these things? Yeah, um, for me particularly, I'm per I'm interested in fast radio burst populations, and so I um, am looking at you know these fast radio burst populations as a whole and trying to make sure we can um, correct for observational biases to really get a handle on how these uh, FRBs might have properties intrinsically as opposed to just like what we observe. Mm -hmm. And um, more broadly, you know, we, we've, we've put out a catalog for a few hundred bursts, but we've discovered, of course, more bursts after the catalog um, cutoff date. And so um, that includes other interesting sources like um, another set of repeaters. So some bursts are seen to repeat and some bursts don't repeat. And there are tantalizing hints that they might come from two different populations of fast radio bursts, the repeaters and the non-repeaters. And so, you know, delving more into that is a source of big excitement as well. Um, ultimately, it would be nice to, um, there's a time outriggers project that's going on where we have partner telescopes built at other sites, and then we can kind of triangulate bursts on the sky so we could get really precise localization. So using that, we could, um, you know, also delve more into kind of cosmological studies with uh, fast radio bursts themselves. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement ahead with, uh, fast radio bursts as far as science to be done goes. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Caitlin. It was a delight talking with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. And that was Caitlin Shin, a graduate student at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Next week, we're going to be talking with Dr. Kathy Olkin. Um, we're going to be discussing Lucy, the 
first mission to explore the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. So make sure to visit with us then. Take your shoes off. Stay a while. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early, together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and a whole lot more. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Y'all come back now. Yeah. Mm-hmm.